I think that it's um, it's an exciting world. I think that people become much more productive. They're capable of doing much more, learning much more. They have a personal tutor, which never gets bored, never gets uninterested in them, is extremely available and affordable, who can sit with them, teach them new concepts, educate them on stuff, entertain them. You have something that's really compelling sitting next to you and, and always available. Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Ausgabe von Handelsblatt Disrupt, dem Podcast über neue Ideen, Disruptionen und zukunftsweisende Technologie. Mein Name ist Stefan Scheuer und ich begrüße Sie heute ganz herzlich anstelle unseres Chefredakteurs Sebastian Mattes. Und zwar aus San Francisco, wo ich als Korrespondent über das Silicon Valley und die größten Technologiekonzerne der Welt berichte. Ohne ihn wären weder ChatGPT noch eines der anderen neuen Werkzeuge auf Basis künstlicher Intelligenz möglich. Die Rede ist von Aidan Gomez. Er ist einer der Autoren des legendären Forschungspapiers, das den jüngsten KI-Boom ausgelöst hat. Während seiner Zeit beim Suchmaschinenbetreiber Google fand er zusammen mit seinen Kollegen einen Weg, KI-Systeme viel effizienter zu machen. Ein Detail für dich besonders nett. Das Autorenteam wählte damals einen Titel mit einer Anspielung auf ein Lied der Beatles. Ihre Studie nannten sie... Attention is all you need. Sieben Jahre ist das jetzt her. Heute hat Gomez seine eigene Firma aufgebaut. Die nennt sich Cohere, was so viel wie Zusammenhängen heißt. Und sie sitzt in Toronto. Ganz in der Nähe von der Gegend, in der Gomez aufgewachsen ist. Ich habe ihn getroffen, als Gomez hier in San Francisco ein neues Büro seiner Firma eröffnet hat. Mit ihm habe ich darüber gesprochen, warum er und alle seine Co-Autoren des legendären KI-Forschungspapiers Google verlassen haben warum manche moderne Sprachmodelle schlechter als ihre Vorgänger sind und warum ein Kunde aus Deutschland sich eher für Cohere statt für OpenAI mit ChatGPT entscheiden sollte. Nach einer kurzen Unterbrechung geht es gleich weiter. Bleiben Sie dran. Willkommen in der Zukunft der Technologie mit dem Handelsblatt Summit Zukunft IT. Seien Sie Teil der IT-Flagship-Tagung des Handelsblatts, bei welcher führende Köpfe der IT-Branche zusammenkommen, um die neuesten Trends und Herausforderungen der digitalen Transformation zu diskutieren. Vernetzen Sie sich mit Branchenführern und finden Sie Lösungen, die Ihr Unternehmen voranbringen. Exklusiv für unsere Podcast-Hörer sichern Sie sich jetzt 20% Rabatt auf Ihre Anmeldung. Besuchen Sie zukunft-it.jetzt und verwenden Sie den Vorteilscode PODCAST. Und damit zu meinem Gespräch mit Aiden Gomez, Chef des KI-Unternehmens Cohere in Toronto. Hi, Aiden. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Aiden, I would actually want to start in the beginning, meaning I uh, heard you talk about um, you growing up among maple trees. How did you get interested in computer science in the first place in rural Canada? Yeah, I grew up in in the middle of a, a maple forest. Every every March, we would like harvest, you know, tap the trees, take the buckets, take it to the the sugar shack. Um, This is like the most Canadian, Canadian thing. So stereotypical. <laughs> It's embarrassing. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in the middle of the woods in rural Ontario, and so I, I felt like technology was kind of always just out of reach. My friends who lived in town, they had high speed. I had dial up. Uh, and so I could never do the same stuff that my friends could do. They could game online, they could stream video, they could all this other stuff. And I was kind of just stuck with our home desktop PC. Um, and this distance from technology and being able to see people accessing it in such a compelling way, it made it magical to me, right? Like it's like that thing that's just out of reach, but that you know others have and you want it so badly. And so I became obsessed with computers. I would like take everything apart. I got a Nintendo Wii. I deconstructed that and tried to, you know, mess around with it. I got, you know, my family computer. I'm sure I've bricked a few of those from just playing around and trying to, you know, learn how it works and make it work better and faster. So from I also like the term brick because you basically turn it into a brick. Literally a brick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I just got obsessed with technology and then I, I knew that it's what I wanted to do with my life. In terms of how I got specifically into AI, not another computer science subfield, I just happened to be born in Toronto uh, or near Toronto. 
And so what people might not know is that AI has such a deep history with Toronto. So Jeffrey Hinton is there. He educated pretty much every big name in AI that's emerged. He created this new wave of artificial intelligence, which is deep neural networks. Um, he is the one who still, uh, till today, gets named as the godfather of AI, as so much of his research actually led to um, what's possible today, right? Totally. He, he really led the charge. And through a lot of resistance and friction, uh, there were a lot of people telling him, you know, your area of research is a waste, don't spend time on it, don't fund it. And no one would fund it, actually. And so he, you know, because he couldn't get funding, he went to Canada and there was this institute called CIFAR in Canada, which was willing to fund him. And that's where, why he ended up where he ended up, um, as opposed to, let's say, here in the Valley and Stanford or something. Um, so yeah, he he pushed through all that resistance and he created this new wave of, AI inspired, loosely inspired by the brain and our biology. Um, and I happened to be at the same school as him when I was studying in undergrad. And so I reached out to him and he connected me to his students. And so I, I grew up and so did my co-founder, Nick, under his tutelage. And later on, I ended up working for him at Google Brain. Yeah, so you started um, by doing your bachelor at the University of Toronto, then you did your PhD with the University of Oxford, and you interned basically with Google Brain. You pointed towards Jeffrey Hinton as one of the founding fathers of what we're doing with AI today, but during that time there, you were also part of a paper um, attention is all you need is the name of it that actually lays the foundation of what we're looking at with um, with generative AI these days. What's so significant about this paper? Yeah, so the paper really, it introduced a new type of structure to AI. Uh, we have been, we had been experimenting with all these different, what we call them as architectures uh, of neural networks. And this one introduced one that just turned out to be dramatically more efficient. It scaled up more efficiently. It ran faster. It, um, it was just an extremely performant medium to work with. Um, and what that enabled is when we sort of figured out that neural networks get better and better and better with scale, it was the default choice because it was the best scaling one. And the entire community adopted it pretty much every single language model you inter uh, I'm, actually I can probably say every single language model you interact with is a transformer model uh, and it just kind of took over the field it also started to go beyond language itself and start to interact with uh, stuff like audio stuff like images uh, and hopefully soon we'll see you know video transformers as well uh, but it became the dominant architecture that people build with in AI <laughs> Explain what made it so special. I mean, uh, for example, Google Translate was already there, so you could translate sentences from one language to the other, but you actually put the attention to the transformer. What's so specific or if, what makes it so interesting? I think the, the transformer is special for a few reasons. Um, and they're kind of like low level and very technical and boring. Um, but the, the most special thing about it, like I said, was the fact that it scales so well. And so there's this property with these neural nets. The reason they're called large language models, if you heard the term large language models, um, is because they have to be large to be good. Like the models genuinely get more intelligent, the bigger we make them, they, they acquire entirely new abilities. They start to be extremely good coders. They start to be, you know, perfect translators, um, And they do this as a product of scale. And so even five years ago, we were training models that were probably, like the largest model was probably like a thousand, two thousand times smaller than the largest model today. And so in half a decade, we've 1000 X in the scale of these things. Um, and I think we're going to see that continue to happen because in that same time, time period, um, The capabilities have gone from 
you know, these models struggle to string together a coherent sentence. Like they can barely, you know, start one and then finish it properly. Um, to now they're capable of doing extremely sophisticated intellectual tasks, which we thought only humans could do. And so I, I think we're still early along that path towards a more capable AI. Uh, we're only a few years into that project. Um, but what we're seeing already is just, it's extraordinary. Maybe to just um, find um, a, a way to explain it to like a broader audience. Um, uh, one thing that helped me was looking at some of those text robots that in the past were capable of, you just gave them a couple of hints of something to write. And it sounded interesting, but it completely drifted off. Where if, as with the transformer and especially the attention models, it suddenly got coherent, right? So um, some people say, oh, what those things do, it's just like a probability machine to predict the next word. And others actually interpret some kind of sentience into it. Yeah, yeah. So w where do you stand? Well, I, would, I wouldn't poo-poo uh, being a probability predictor. I, I think that's actually an extremely sophisticated difficult problem in order to accurately predict the future in order to ac accurately predict um you know the next word in a sentence you have to have a very deep understanding of the world so you're not just asking it to be like a probability predictor uh, literally you are but in principle that's a very very difficult task and it demands so much prior knowledge and so much understanding um The delineation between sentience and not sentience, I think philosophers have been debating for for ages. Uh, I, I think it's fascinating. I have my own opinions on the subject. Um, but it's not it's not clear to me, it's not obvious to me where that line is and which side of it LLMs sit on. So what are your own thoughts on that? That it's not clear. That I, I think it's not obvious. Anyone who tells you definitively LLMs are not conscious or definitively they are. I, I think the, the the definition of consciousness is so blurry um, and it's, it's such a um, hotly contested definition that keeps coming up into prominence and keeps getting knocked back down. And also the goalposts keep moving, right? Like before we had machines that could do very sophisticated mathematical computation, like calculators. We would say, you know, that is the unique property of humans. We can do such sophisticated reasoning on numbers and logic. Then we created machines that could do that. And, and then we moved the goalposts a little bit further and we said, well, you know, we that isn't the entire story. That's a part of it. And yes, machines can do that, but they can't do this other thing. And so just looking historically, we've never had this objective list, which is like, when we have a machine that can do A, B, C, and D, we know we've made it. That is consciousness. We still don't have that list. And I, I expect we'll continue to move the goalposts for quite some time. So how close are the machines in mimicking what we as humans can do. I, I had an interview with Sam Altman just a couple of weeks ago where he was saying, well, we're already at a point where online, it's very difficult to tell apart whether a text has been written by a human or whether a picture has been taken by a human or a camera. Um, he went a step further saying, oh, we have to scan our irises so we know who's a human and who is not. But what, what do you think? Like, where do those models take us? Um, like today where we are, I, I think there are models that exist today which exceed the knowledge of the average human in a litany of subjects. Like I, I can say with some confidence that Cohere's models have a better understanding of biology and medicine than I do, certainly. But I think they're worse than doctors, right? Like experts in that domain, I think they certainly underperform doctors, but they're better than me. Uh, same thing in like specialized domains of of knowledge like mathematics or physics, you know, I might be better than the language model at understanding language models, which is pretty funny on its face. Um, but it's better than me in tons of other ways. So we're starting to see that relative to the average human across a suite of different sources of knowledge or areas of expertise, the models are exceeding 
the average human. But that's not really the relevant project. The relevant project is we want to exceed the best human at that specialty. So we want models that are capable of being better than any doctor, than any mathematician, than any physicist. Um, we're nowhere close to that. And so that's that's the project that we're pressing out towards. Um, but even the status quo, if we actually look at look at it, it's extraordinarily impressive. These models are capable of of so much. They're they're smarter than I am. So um, the long term goal is for example, being able to have an artificial general intelligence. You said we're far away, but what's your prediction? I mean, there are some people already giving out some dates. Do you have an idea of if we're going to reach it? And if yes, when? Yeah, I, I've been wrong too many times about my timelines to trust them anymore. And I, I think um, it's so hard to put a specific number on it. Um, it's probably... The air bounds are so wide and, and so far that it's not worth doing. I, I used to think the technology that we have today, about six years ago, five years ago, I thought it was about a quarter century away. I thought it was about 25 to 40 years. Uh, and it showed up today. And so I, I don't make predictions about <laughs> the future of AI anymore. But a lot has already changed in your life. You were 20 when the Attention is All You Need paper came out. You're 27 now, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you started um, Cohere in 2019. Um, where does Cohere stand now? Uh, so we've become the enterprise large language modeling company. So very focused on data privacy and bringing these models into the enterprise environment, which has different constraints than the consumer environment. Um, I think principle among those constraints is data privacy. So we've seen a lot of trust burned by people, you know, using these models, putting in information, um, bringing them into their workflow, and then that data being used to train a future version of the model. And suddenly, corporate secrets are being leaked into these models which are accessible by anyone. And so that's a huge barrier for adoption. If people don't trust the technology, if they don't trust that their data is theirs and that their models are theirs, um, they won't adopt it. They won't put it into production. So Cohere's focus has been deploying very securely within environments where our customers know that we can't take that model out and give it to someone else or see their data and potentially leak it or lose it. Um, so our priority has been data privacy as well as being cloud agnostic. So we're available on AWS, on Oracle, on Google, uh, Azure, and even on-prem. So totally cloud agnostic. So if I'm a company um, and I pick Cohere, what can you do that others can't? Yeah, so I think our models, they span um, a further breadth. So we have both the generative models, which you're probably familiar with. They're like the large language models that you can chat to, that you can get them to write code for you, that type of thing. But also embedding models, which let you do search, which let you classify stuff, uh, re-rank stuff. Um, so we have two different categories of model. The second thing is, of course, cloud independence. So if you're you know, today on GCP, but in the future, you're planning on moving to another cloud provider. Um, GCP is Google... Uh, Google Cloud. Cloud. Yeah. GCP, Cloud Platform, Google right? Cloud Platform. Yeah, I think they, they rebranded, but I, uh, I'm i stuck <laughs> in my brain with GCP. Um, so yeah, Google Cloud. Cloud. If you're on Google Cloud today, you might not be, hopefully you are, but you, know, you might not be in five years. And if a core piece of your stack is proprietary to one cloud provider that really encumbers your move to another. You're locked in. And so you lose your negotiating leverage, you get a worse deal. It's threatening to the business for often these cloud contracts are hundreds of millions or you know billions of dollars. Um, and so very important to us is that we can move with the customer wherever you want to serve, whether it's on this cloud, that cloud, or in your own data center, we'll go, we'll come with our models and we'll, we'll serve you there. What data did you train your models on? So we have a mix of data. The first source is the general web. 
So we go out through the internet and we collect sources of information and we train on that. All the large language model providers do that. Another source is in-house proprietary data. And so we partner with organizations like Scale, App, and others um, to create these data sets of knowledge. And sometimes from very specialized expert sources like coders or like uh, doctors. Um, and so we go out and we collect and we uh, annotate this data and bring it into the model and teach it new stuff that way. When you say that um, customers can trust you better, how will you perform in the longer run? As you already stated, the more data you put in, the better the model gets. And the others, don't they have like an advantage by taking as much as they can? Um, it's, not, it's not so much about um, the more data, the better. Quality is what's key. Um, so I think in general, if you have more data, it is better, but not if that data is worse and it, it detracts. It needs to hit the quality bar that you're shooting for. Um, so for us, we have ample amounts of data uh, and we continue to collect more and more at higher and higher quality. Um, the sorts of data that our competitors train on, it looks a lot like ours. Uh, we source it in different ways, potentially, by either paying for it to be created or acquiring it from other companies. Um, but we don't view ourselves as structurally at a disadvantage. What we see is in those first generations of large language models, much of the content that was used to train those models was still human generated. Now we see a lot of content online increasingly gets created by those models. So what does that mean for the future if the second, the third, the fourth generation of those models actually gets trained by content that was produced by the predecessor of the same model? Yeah, so if, if that data is unhelpful, it's damaging, right? So if that data was worse than the data that you otherwise would have gotten by collecting from humans, that's a bad thing. Um, but oftentimes what we see is there's already a lot of garbage out on the web. And so for that first phase that I was describing, where we crawl the web and collect knowledge and information from there, there's already junk out there. There's, you know, random strings and just pages of noise and nonsense. Um, and so we have very robust systems to clean that up, to detect stuff that isn't useful to the model, doesn't add new knowledge, and filter it out. And so whether that is coming from a human or whether that's has been written by a machine, those systems will catch when it's not useful for the model to train on and filter it out. Help us better understand how you actually build the model. We talked about the data. So you get data online, you get data from different sources, you feed them into the model. But ultimately, humans are also playing a large role in fine-tuning those models. How does that process work? Yeah, so there's the initial training phase, which is on the web data. And then there's a phase after that, which creates these more chatty versions of the model. Um, some people call them instruct models. We call ours uh, a command model. Um, and so it's a model that you can give it an instruction, give it a command, and it returns, you know, the result of what you asked for. Um, and that process involves those humans that I was describing, creating data that explains to the model, here's how I want you to interact. When a user comes to you and asks something that looks like this, here's the sort of thing I want you to respond. And so when we fine tune that, it kind of goes from being this big, unformed mess of knowledge. When, when you train it on the web, you pick up all that mess. And so it's kind of unruly. The model knows a lot about a bunch of different stuff, but it's not very structured. Its knowledge isn't very structured. So you take that unstructured mess and you, using humans, which teach it and guide it and show it the way to respond, you start to form it into something much more useful, much easier to talk to and, and put into production. So that's the second phase. You have these chatbot-like models, which are much more fluent, intuitive, also safer, right? They tend to refuse to respond to unsafe queries. Um, there's one step after that, which is 
actual enterprise's fine tuning. So that model up until this point, it only knows what it's seen in the training data, which is what it read out on the public web and then what it learned from the humans when it interacted with them. None of that is going to be your organization's proprietary internal data. And so it's inherently not as useful as it could be. So what you do is you take that second phase of the model and you continue fine tuning it on your proprietary data and you produce something that's unique to you. Um, so that's kind of the final phase is where we personalize it or make it more relevant for the specific organization that's adopting it. So um, if, if I'm, uh, I just try to summarize it like in a more general way, please correct me if I'm wrong. So the model itself would basically learn language, how to understand language, how to produce language. And as soon as I do the fine tuning as a company, I can teach it, I don't know, the details of um, a company producing drugs, for example, all of the trials they did, of the tr drugs they already have on the market, of the future products they have. So the, the specific knowledge of this particular company, totally. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that company's internal knowledge, its expertise, its in institutional knowledge um, gets picked up as part of that fine tuning phase. Um, but everything before that is kind of preparing it for that. Uh, so getting it to a point where it's fluent enough, generally knowledgeable about the world enough to take that information and turn it into something useful. Uh, we've seen with those models that they can be incredibly capable, but sometimes they hallucinate and they produce mistakes. And the more complicated the task you um, allocate to them, the more difficult it actually gets to spot those hallucinations. So how do you deal with hallucinations? Yeah, it's it's an issue uh, in the current version of the technology. Um, and, you know, I, I, the first thing I would say is that models don't want to hallucinate. Hallucinating is actually a really hard thing for the model to do, like because it has to make something up, has to dream something up. It would much prefer to just be able to already know the thing that you're asking and respond. It's much easier. It's, it's a hard problem to dream something up. It's an easy problem to just copy and paste from some knowledge and give it out. Um, so it's it's not for want not for lack of trying from the model's perspective, but there is a new format of working with these models, which is kind of rising to prominence, which is called RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation. And so the idea is you sit these models next to sources of knowledge, knowledge bases, which they can go out and query, return documents from, and then use those as part of its answer. And it can actually cite those documents. So now you don't need to just take the model at its word. You can actually click through and check its citations and read, okay, you're claiming X, Y, and Z. I'm going to look at that citation and see that, it, oh, okay, the document actually does indeed say X, Y, and Z. Um, so coming back to the drug company, it will give me a link to, I don't know, the PDF file with the trial that's currently ongoing when asking a question about it. Exactly, exactly. So the, like um, another way of thinking about this is you and I, we outsource a lot of our memory to Google, right? I don't actually have to keep all my knowledge stored inside my head. What I need to do is I need to know what to search for. I can make a Google, read it, and now I can give you the answer having you know, looked it up and done my research. The models need to be able to do the same thing. It shouldn't be on them to memorize every piece of information ever. Um, what they should be able to do is go out and query and search for that information when they need it, as they need it, and then incorporate that as part of their responses. Um, another topic has been model degeneration. So we've seen a couple of trials, especially run with uh, GPT-4, um, from OpenAI, where, for example, defining pi number, I hope that's the right word in English, um, the accuracy went down. How do you see that? And does it apply to your models too? Um, so, I, I, I mean, I've heard of what you're, what you're describing. I've seen tweets on Twitter and um, some preprints that got, got released. I, I don't know the extent to which that's actually happening. I can say at Cohere, we update our models fairly frequently, like once every two weeks, once every week. Um, and so they do change over time. And sometimes there are genuine regressions. Um, 
Of course. But how can that be? Like my notion would be, oh, a newer model has to be better, but sometimes it's not. Why? Yeah, so every week we're making like subtle changes in the data. We're trying to improve it. We're trying to find ways to make it smarter in general. And that's according to some, you know, overarching score, which we, let's pretend we call it like the Cohere model score. Uh, and so every week we're trying to push that score up, but it's a general score. It encompasses coding, math, all these different tasks that the model needs to do. Um, but sometimes you might get a huge lift in coding and a small lift, a uh, small decrease in another field. Um, and so overall it looks good because there's a huge lift in coding. But for the user who cares about that decrease in that one specific use case, from their perspective, the model has only gotten worse. So th this happens from time to time, and we try to mitigate that and correct for that. And the way we do that is by listening to the customer and also giving them choice. So they can choose not to accept this new model. They can reject it and stick with the one that they've been using. Um, How long will that actually be possible? I mean, this is also one of the, one of the sales pitches that you uh, put out saying, oh, with the others, such as um, OpenAI, I rely on version XYZ, but after a couple of weeks, it's going to be depreciated. So I will be forced as a client to shift, whereas with you, I can lock in one and I can continue using it. How long can I do it? Will there be an expiry date? Um, I think with, within reason, there probably will be an expiry date at some point. At some point, you'll want to change. Like our mission is to continue improving this technology so that it's a no-brainer for you to upgrade and choose the latest. Um, when you zoom in to a very small time scale, like within a month, the models that we released in that month, you might see some flux and maybe you don't want to accept this one. But on the time scale of a six months, a year, it should be profoundly obvious that you want to upgrade because the capabilities have increased so much. Um, but of course, you know, we're going to listen to our customers. And if they tell us we like that one from last year, we want to stick with it. We're not going to mess with that. Nach einer kurzen Unterbrechung geht es gleich weiter. Bleiben Sie dran. Zinsen, Immobilien, Geopolitik, das Jahr der Entscheidungen. Das ist das Motto des diesjährigen Bankengipfels. Banken sehen sich gerade mit einer Vielzahl von Krisen konfrontiert. In dieser Situation sind unabhängige Information und Orientierung wichtiger denn je. Beim Bankengipfel erwarten sie daher News und Networking sowie wertvolle Impulse von Vordenkern aus Banken und Tech. Wir freuen uns auf Sie am 4. und 5. September in Frankfurt. Mit dem Vorteilscode BANKENGIPFEL24 erhalten Sie 15% auf den Teilnehmerpreis unter handelsblatt-bankengipfel.de. Where are we in this overall development of, of those models? I mean, they're supposed to be completely multimodal so that I can put in not only text, but video, audios, and it's supposed to be possible to produce audios and videos. Especially with video, we see still a lot of room for improvement, but where are we on this on this path? I, I think video is going to get better quickly. The, the issue is it's just so computationally expensive to generate video. Um, and so there are more efficiency wins that need to happen before we unlock that at scale. Um, with the other modalities, image generation, if you look at mid-journey, it's incredible, like extraordinary. Um, the quality that's there. Um, so I, I think we're knocking off modalities one by one. Also, audio generation is starting to get really quite compelling. Um, in terms of where the technology is going, the next, for me, the next most interesting thing is agents and the idea of these models being able to act over long time scales. Not just an interaction, not just a, hey, what's the answer to this question? Or, hey, write me this piece of code. Uh, and then response, I'm done. Um, but something that persists over time that can carry out, you know, complicated actions on your behalf that require many steps and checks along the way. Can you give an example? I mean, the canonical example is the notion of a true artificially intelligent uh, personal assistant, which you could say... It has access to a web browser and you can give it an instruction, you know, uh, 
what's the canonical instruction? Book me a flight. And it goes out and does some research and checks all the different prices and it chooses that one. And, you know, it knows that you like sitting in a window and blah, blah, blah. So it, it both can explore the web and do research for you, like exploring each of those different options, comparing and contrasting them. And it knows you. It's had this long relationship with you. It's been working with you for the past 12 months. And so it knows that you like that window seat. And so it picks the perfect flight for you and, and books it. Um, extrapolate that into any task that a human can do sitting in front of a web browser, including doing research, learning about the latest neural network architectures or, uh, you know, new types of, uh, you know, RNA vaccines, that type of thing. And you start to get extremely compelling systems to augment people with. It gives everyone an assistant, which can do everything from very mundane tasks for you to uh, extraordinarily complex research. How would a world look like where all of us have this kind of assistant accompanying us, listening to other conversations? Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I think that it's, um, it's an exciting world. I think that people become much more productive. They're capable of doing much more, learning much more. They have a personal tutor, which never gets bored, never gets uninterested in them, is extremely available and affordable, who can sit with them, teach them new concepts, educate them on stuff, uh, entertain them. You have something that's really compelling sitting next to you and, and always available. Um, I think that's an exciting world on a lot of different fronts, both from, uh, as a consumer myself, wanting to have access to um, fantastic, you know, experiences as a shopper or as a customer of some, uh, you know, whatever company. Um, and then all the way to being a researcher and needing help writing a paper, needing help doing background research, surfacing relevant uh, past literature being able to ask an assistant to go do that for you and assist you. I think that's an incredibly powerful augmentative capacity. How is it possible that it's especially smaller and younger startups such as Cohere, such as OpenAI, who are driving this technology? You've worked for Google, you authored this paper, you, were, you and your seven co-authors all left the company Why are those small companies so successful? What makes you so successful? I, I think it's ambition. Um, I think that, you know, in a startup, it is truly make or break. It's existential. And uh, so as a product, you attract people who are hugely ambitious and willing to, you know, take a risk to change the world in some dramatically positive way. Um, that gives you an urgency and an excitement and an intensity in your work that I haven't been able to find elsewhere. I think that's probably the unique piece. Of course, you know, all the large companies have massive capital and resource advantages, which a startup couldn't possibly hope to compete with. Um, but what we do have is ambition and intensity and a hunger to make change. When it comes to rolling out those models, there are also a lot of open legal questions. In the European Union, for example, there are strict uh, data privacy rules. There is an AI act coming up. And there's, for example, one very basic case. Um, European customer just um, approaches one of, one of the LLM providers and says, I want to know which personal data you use to train your model and I just want to, to delete it. Is that possible with Kuhir, given that you might have used data online that was just out there for somebody. Could you just take it out? Yeah, yeah, we could. Um, so obviously we know all the data that goes into our models. And we're able to audit that. And if we have a particular entry or a particular web page or whatever, um, we're able to pull that out. And the next time we train the model, it won't include that. And so we can intervene over time. Um, and we can make those changes. 
uh, especially training those models takes a lot of compute. Um, we recently had studies uh, looking at, for example, water consumption, but also energy consumption. What's the environmental footprint of Cohere running those large language models? So we train on uh, Google Cloud, uh, which has TPUs, um, and Google's cloud, Google Cloud's energy profile is very, very clean. Um, I forget the specific number, but I believe it's over 90% um, non-carbon energy. So we're fortunate by the fact that those supercomputers are powered by energy, which is extremely clean. Um, but this is a concern. We're always looking for more efficient compute, stuff that requires less power, uh, is easier to build, is recyclable. Um, and so it's definitely a concern. You are based in Toronto. We are meeting now here in San Francisco, especially here in, in San Francisco. There's like a whole hub of AI-driven companies. With Toronto, you mentioned Jeffrey Hinton. There is also a hub. How do you see the global race for AI and what are the hotspots and why? Yeah, so obviously Toronto has its historical advantage and the fact that You know, the University of Toronto and Waterloo and Mila, the Montreal universities, they attract very high AI talent. Um, but yeah, like you say, in SF, there's a crazy boom in AI startups here and the community is growing extremely quickly. Uh, the other place that I see is London. So our, our main hubs are Toronto, San Francisco and London. Um, and London is extraordinary, like tons and tons of extremely ambitious talent. Um, so yeah, those are kind of like the three primary places I see. Behind those three, I would say um, Montreal, uh, New York, uh, Paris is emerging as a, a strong player. Um, so super exciting to see all these little hubs pop up all over the globe. Just to come to an end, um, was there, as you have a big overview of the entire landscape, was there something that you saw recently where you just said, This is truly amazing. This is something that you did not have on your radar, and it's very, very interesting. Uh, I come from a research background, and so even though I'm the CEO and I spend a lot of my time you know, doing interviews or selling on behalf of the company or raising money, um, I stay very close to the tech and the research, and probably to an annoying extent, <laughs> I insert myself in, in those parts of the company. Um, but th there are like results that we see, um, occasionally, which just totally shock me, just bewildering. Um, can you give an example? I like the one that, the one that is in my mind, I don't know how much I can say about, um, but I can talk about like the general space that it occupies, which is the idea of these models, um, teaching themselves, right? And like self-improving, getting better without humans contributing data or without scraping data or anything like that. It's just these mo models interacting with each other and to some extent learning or refining their existing knowledge. Um, I think that's going to be a very, very exciting technical subject. So next time when we talk, do you think an AI would have taken over the CEO's job <laughs> within Korea? If I do my job, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. There, there is, I, on the job piece, I think it's a fascinating conversation to be had. Um, I think this technology is going to augment humans as opposed to replace them. Um, so I view it as like a positive force. It'll sit next to us. It'll make each one of us dramatically more productive. Um, And humanity is is supply constrained. We need to be doing more. We need to be more productive. Um, so I think that's that's how I see things. But if I do get replaced, I've done a very good job. So I'd be quite happy. <laughs> so let's see if the next interview is going to be with your AI replacement. Yeah. Aiden, thank you so much. That has been very interesting. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Und damit sind wir auch schon wieder am Ende von Handelsblatt Disrupt. 
wie immer freuen wir uns über Kommentare. Schreiben Sie uns gerne eine E-Mail oder wie gewohnt in die Disrupt LinkedIn-Gruppe. Die Details finden Sie in den Show Notes. Danke an dieser Stelle für die Unterstützung an Regina Körner und Migo Fecke von Professional Podcasts, dem Dienstleister für Strategieberatung und Podcastproduktion. Übrigens, gerade haben wir den Internationalen Tag der Pressefreiheit begangen. Das ist der Tag, der von der UNESCO initiiert wurde, um auf die Gefahren aufmerksam zu machen, denen Journalisten bei ihrer Arbeit ausgesetzt sind. Gerade auch in Kriegsgebieten wie der Ukraine oder dem Gazastreifen und in Ländern wie Russland, China, Venezuela oder im Nahen Osten. In diesem Jahr alleine sind schon elf Kollegen bei der Arbeit gestorben. Über 500 sitzen in Haft. Ihr Anliegen? Berichten, was wirklich geschieht. Das tun wir jeden Tag. Und das unterstützen Sie mit Ihrem Abo. Für kurze Zeit erhalten Sie ein Jahr 50% Rabatt auf das digitale oder gedruckte Handelsblatt und haben so Zugriff zu allen aktuellen Berichten, zu unserem Archiv, zu unseren Analysen, Insights und Reportagen aus allen Winkeln der Welt. Schauen Sie mal nach unter handelsblatt.com slash pressefreiheit oder in den Shownotes. In der nächsten Woche begrüßt Sie Sebastian Mattes wieder an dieser Stelle. Ich wünsche Ihnen eine gute Zeit. Mein Name ist Stefan Scheuer. Tschüss. Eine Weltreise starten? Ihr Hobby ausleben? Finanzielle Unabhängigkeit muss kein Traum bleiben. In der neuen Vivo Coach Masterclass erfahren Sie, wie Sie das Vermögen dafür aufbauen und es einsetzen. Kurzweilige Videos, spannende Inhalte, konkret umsetzbare Empfehlungen. Entdecken Sie das neue kostenlose Video-Learning-Format exklusiv für Abonnentinnen und Abonnenten der Wirtschaftswoche. Jetzt unter vivo.de coach masterclass. Vivo Coach. Wissen, dass sich auszahlt. Thank you.